now that we've heard from our representatives from our state associations, we'd like to shift gears and hear what's going on at other national organization levels who actually work with officials. On this panel, we have individuals from the collegiate, high school, and youth sports levels, and we're excited to hear what they are doing in the areas of officials recruitment and retention. So the panel includes, sitting right next to me, is Greg Turner, the director of basketball for the Amateur Athletic Union. Next to him, we have Phil Risen, the executive director of the National Air Scholastic Athletic Administrators Association, or NIAAA. Next to him, we've got Kennedy Wells, the director of membership for the American Volleyball Coaches Association, or ADCA. And then we have, but I can't see it, there's Anthony, I'm, I'm leaning really far forward. <laughs> and we've got um, Anthony Holden, who is the manage, managing director of the National Collegiate Athletic Association. And last but not least, we have Robert Kern, secretary of the National Officials Committee for USA Track and Field. Let's give a warm welcome to our panel. jump right in. So for all panelists, and all of these questions are geared for everybody on the panel, first and foremost, what do you see as the biggest problem within your organization in terms of officiating? Um, good afternoon, good evening everybody, and thank you again for inviting me, uh, Dana. Uh, I work at the Amateur Athletic Union, as she uh, just mentioned, and when you hear AAU, the first thing that probably comes to mind is basketball, track and field, we run the largest volleyball tournament in the world, but uh, few people understand the dynamics of, of the Amateur Athletic Union, and uh, it's the oldest and largest youth organization in the, in the country. So one of the things that we want to do and we're trying to do, it's all about education. That is, that is first and foremost, and we've talked about it in some of our breakout sessions, is understanding understanding how to be able to officiate and what it takes to officiate and from there uh, moving forward because uh, most of officials get their start in recreation, uh, uh, doing something with the Amateur Athletic Union, which everything that's non-scholastic is not AAU. <laughs> People understand that. Uh, there's a lot of different youth organizations out there, so everybody calls basketball, yeah, it's AAU, but, but not so. But education is first and foremost for, for anybody that wants to be able to officiate because the AAU uses a lot of state associations for uh, their officials in regards to that. So education is huge for us. Thank you. I'm Phil Rise with the NIAAA. Thanks, Dana, uh, Carissa, for, you know, last year we weren't, we, uh, I just took over as the executive director on Monday. So you want to talk about really getting the ground running or whatever. So, you know, last year we, uh, we did not attend and, and whatever, and uh, maybe we weren't, we weren't invited. I don't know. You know, I learned a long time ago that primarily if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. And so with that, you know, I, I want to say this and honestly say this, uh, sitting here the last, uh, last night and today, uh, I can tell you it's been a little bit like being in church in the fact of being convicted. Primarily my background as a school administrator, I was a coach, I was an umpire, I was an assistant principal athletic director, I ultimately became a director of operations, ultimately an assistant superintendent. So I've seen all facets of that. And so when you talk about the NIAAA and what we can do and how we can do it and whatever, we're an educational institution in the sense that we want to teach and learn. And with that, for us right now, if you look at it, the problem that we're dealing with or what we hear from our athletic administrators primarily is the behavior that we're dealing with with parents. And you deal with that issue from the standpoint of the culture that's grown to exist. And it's a culture that, you know, I learned a long time ago as a system principal, you get what you tolerate. And if we continue to allow it, then at that point it's going to continue to occur. So we're excited to be here, to hear what we're hearing here, and to be able to take back and to be able to share with our members and to do better in the sense of being hospitable toward our officials from a recruitment and training standpoint. Uh, you know, uh, to me, our athletic administrators probably can be a great identifier for identifying future, future officials and maybe making those connections with that. So, you know, we're excited to be here. The one thing that concerns us besides that is that, as we've talked about, our athletic administrators have multiple roles. Depending on their location, you know, and, and I'm with Brian back there sitting there. I, I, 
I'm from Kentucky and Julian and, and Butcher back there and did my time there. There's pockets of excellence throughout the country of athletic administrators that are doing a great job. And maybe that's their only role. But then there's also those areas in the country where you might have an athletic director that's teaching four or five classes and then staying. Now they get there in the morning at 7 a.m. and you look up and it's 9.30 p.m. and they're going home. So, you know, when we talk about things in which we can do better and we talk about treating our officials, because that's a big part of it. I know it's an umpire. It's a very big part of it. We need to remember also, too, maybe a little grace for our athletic administrators as they're working their, those roles and those multiple roles. So we're excited to be here and looking forward to continued collaboration. First of all, I just want to say uh, thanks to Dana and to the NFHS, uh, the entire staff and team for putting this on. I was a part of uh, Consortium 1.0, so happy to be back. Um, but. I think our biggest challenge uh, with the ABCA really uh, comes down to uh, just bridging that gap between uh, coaches and officials in terms of relationship building. Um, sometimes it's more of a us versus them mentality, and uh, we definitely want to try to eradicate that type of mindset. Um, uh, at the end of the day, coaches are leaders. Uh, they're also guardians, uh, in my specific case, guardians of the sport of volleyball. Uh, we have to understand that, uh, and I think that's been <laughs> repeated over and over as far as uh, the need for officials uh, and the fact that if we don't have them, uh, it's just recess. So uh, if you want to continue to advance your sport, uh, we're going to have to continue to bridge that gap and uh, eradicate that us versus them mentality when it comes to uh, coaches and officials. Uh, Anthony Holman, um, NCAA. I, uh, Thanks to Dana and Carissa for sure. I think this is a, an important conversation to be having. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to take part. Um, in my role at the national office, I think the question was about the challenges. Um, we live in kind of a, a not kind of a, a fairly complex system, if you would. Um, just a brief history, I spent about nine years at the Illinois High School Association, worked in professional baseball, worked in, um, in, in professional basketball, and this, when I started at the NCAA, I thought we were woefully behind. When I started, the first sport I worked on to administrator was um, Division Three field hockey. And when I started to look about how do I find officials, I need to, it's starting to get close to assigning officials for our national championship. No one had any idea, right? There was no way to register them. I had no idea what qualifications these individuals had. It was just kind of like, well, we get some recommendations from our conference coordinators, and that was really scary. So. All of you state association folks, you're way ahead of at least where we were 13 years ago. We've gotten to a better place. But that's, I share that story to say it, it's complex because the role and responsibilities around officiating are, are really shared in different ways at the, at the collegiate level, depending on what division you're in, depending on the size of your conference office, depending on who, um, you know, what state you're in, and, and legally how, how you can uh, engage officials. So it, it creates a, a uh, a challenging situation for us uh, at, at times, but we certainly are trying to wrap our arms around that with uh, a number of alliances that we're building, of, of course, with the Federation as well, so we'll, we'll speak a little bit to that, but that's, that's the biggest challenge for us, is trying to navigate uh, in a complex environment w within our membership. <clears throat> My name is Robert Kern. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm the Secretary of the National Officials Committee the USA Track and Field. Thank you to the Federation for putting this on and treating officials like professionals. But more importantly, to Julie Cochran, because she's the one who corralled me. Um, I am a volunteer, and I have to emphasize that. The National Officials Committee, they are all volunteers. In your state, and we'll just use the state boundaries they're not exact. Every state has an association. And in that state, you have an officials association chair. They are volunteers. Their job is to assist new officials in registering for USA Track and Field. Barriers, number one, you have to be a USA member. It's coming out of your pocket. In my state, my association in Wisconsin pays your officials fee. Another one coming out of your pocket. 
you have to go online and do a background check. Another one coming out of your pocket. You have to go online and take a safe sport class, which is required by USOPC. You have USA officials in your state. They're the same people who do all your high school activities, all your youth activities. They just happen to be people who take advantage of situations in their life, they love what they do, and they go places and they go out of state. Like me, pay a thousand dollar ticket to go to Eugene, Oregon. I sat with a lady this morning, she's from Eugene. It's not an easy place to get into. Compensation is a big package because you're asking people at all these NCAA meets, all these USA meets, to get there on their own dime. Those of you who are, I'll draw a line and say over 50, you came into the educational arena with wide eyes and you're gonna make a difference in the world. And many of you in this room were like me. The school was the center of your life when you were a kid and it became the center of my life when I was an adult. I coached basketball for 35 years. I coached track the same amount of time. I've been an official 48 years. The last 20 in this bigger arena. It's just taking advantage of opportunities. But in this place and time in life, there are just as many young people, not as many as there used to be, who are bright-eyed and want to make a difference. To many younger people, what's in it for me? School ends at what time? 3 o'clock? 3.30? So, how do we make it a viable <coughs> option for younger people to get involved? Wrestling match, basketball, a hockey game, there's a defined beginning and end. A track meet could go from 10 o'clock Saturday morning till 6 o'clock Saturday night. How do we make it a viable option for young people who have families and want to balance their life? Just some thoughts. So if there is something in place within your organization, what is it that your organization is doing specifically to address the recruitment and retention of officials? Well, I'll, I guess I'll go again. Uh, well, uh, again, the structure of the Amateur Athletic Union is, is uh, a little different. Um, you're talking about 35 different sports that we have, um, and we're really, individuals that put on sports. Uh, so you're talking about event operators. Um, so in regards to event operators, how can we assist them? Because right now, this day and age, they're thinking about a few things they've never thought about in the past. They've only thought about the facility, they've only thought about scheduling, and how to attract teams. But now, they have to think about officials. How do I get officials? They have to think about crowd control. Most places, facilities, you can't even rent them right now without making sure that you have a closed police officer in some states. So these are some things that um, event operators, they have no clue about, and we're doing our best to educate them and be able to help them uh, with that in regards to running events, because that's basically what, what we do. Um, from the national office perspective, the events that we run is a little different because we have a partnership with Disney. You know, everybody, they, they hate rats, but they love that mouse. So, uh, and, and, and it's a little different because we have a situation where the events that we put on, yeah, I, I won't say zero tolerance, but we have issues where we have security from Disney and then we have police officers, sheriff. So if we have an incident with fans, I mean, you know, we can, and not officials, but fans, we can have the security and uh, they can go and speak to the fan, then they can ask the plane, the, the sheriffs, and they can trespass them. So that's, that's something a little different. But in regards to officials, yes, we work with a local official, uh, state uh, high school association of science. But what we're doing as an organization is helping event operators understand those different phases and what they have to uh, worry about now. Thanks, Greg. Uh, one of the 
things we're doing right now, we continue to do, and we'll continue to do uh, publication of articles in our IAA magazine, workshops at our national conference, our continued partnership with the National Federation on Public Services Announcements in order to continue to get that, that message out there, make sure that message is consistent. And, and again, as we talk about, you know, how we can be better, you know, the takeaways from this right here. Uh, where Rich and I are able to go out and communicate with our state leaders. And, and I say this, what's so great for us in this, this venue right here is being here with state association commissioners and executive directors primarily and sharing the opportunity for us to be able to collaborate together. And I appreciate what Lance said. I, I go back to when I was the executive director in Kentucky and the fact that I used to travel around our 16 regions or areas and go to a co-op area to be able to talk about being a member of an AD association and how important that is. So it's also an opportunity where we can go and maybe talk about, and you can do that and promote that in a way to help our athletic administrators uh, work within the confines of being better host, understanding responsibilities a little bit better, but also getting that support that starts from the top and works it its way down and then we get the feedback from the bottom that brings itself up and that's the collaboration that we need in order to continue to be successful you know I'm, a, I'm pretty much a positive person you know we can talk about the negatives and we see the negatives there's a whole lot of positive out there as well and sometimes we beat ourselves up in the fact of what we're doing or whatever let's also try to remember to celebrate some successes because we're having a lot of those as well yeah, um, I think the number one thing for uh, ABCA, you know, specific to us, is um, the the group of that, you know, as far as our constituency goes, is the ability to influence a large, youthful uh, pool of applicants uh, or, or potential candidates to be uh, volleyball officials, or uh, you know, in this case, officials. Um, you know, the the group that um, we're, we're talking about in, in terms of coaches. Uh, they have a, a le level of influence that sometimes is, you know, unbelievable in terms of if they talk to their athletes, uh, they will do what the coach says. So um, if they will uh, actually listen to their coach and see uh, officiating as a viable option uh, to stay in the game. Uh, we talked about uh, Mr. Sturator. He got up and talked about how uh, even at the age of 65, he's still uh, playing uh, 20 minutes of, of basketball every day. Well, that's the perfect way to stay in the game and stay active and be an athlete for life. So uh, in terms of our coaches, what we want to try to do is create that awareness, uh, let them realize that everyone may not end up being a professional volleyball player, they may not end up being a coach in our sport, but they do have the opportunity to stay in the game uh, by being officials. Uh, so at the national office, a um, couple things uh, real quick, and I'll, I'll try and be brief, but it, I think it's important to provide some context. Um, so when I assumed kind of the oversight of, of officiating uh, several years ago, um, I had a hypothesis, right, about why we were losing officials and why we couldn't keep them, you know, this and that. And this. But, you know, I couldn't, I, couldn't qual I couldn't qualify that, so I couldn't get any resources supported. So we engaged a group. Mary back there in the picture group to help us with to develop some data to get some real data around why are officials what are we, why are we losing officials why can't what what types of things should we do to retain officials and three things really came out of that um, one was kind of what we've been talking I've been hearing from this group is the treatment of officials was 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 poor and that would that was running folks off compensation and opportunities for advancement. So we just, there was a lot more in there, but those are the three things that were key takeaways for us. So we've developed strategies to attack those. So I'm gonna share with you just briefly what, what that is. The first is around recruitment. So we've created a, number, a couple of programs. One is our uh, play to rep program for our student athletes. Through our student athlete advisory group, we've identified students who have shown interest or uh, already have an application for, or would like to take up officiating out as an application. And I think uh, Julie's talking about in our group here, and we're spotlighting those, right? We're 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 highlighting those in on our social platforms, and, and where they can then help us tell their story to their student for other student athletes to be engaged. So that's that's being helpful. We're identifying they're, they're either self-identifying coaches are identifying them. Our representatives from our student athlete advisory group are help identifying those as well. 
The second is an, uh, an alliance with uh, the National Federation. Um, I keep uh, using this analogy, right, the, the Dr. Seuss books, the Lorax. We're going to feel, at the national office, at the collegiate level, feel, yeah, it, it's a crisis, and, and we're going to, but we're going to feel the, uh, the brunt of that crisis and the loss of officials probably later than you all at the state associations. But we keep plucking from, from your officials, right? So we, we want to plant some seeds as well um, to, to help to build that. So we're, we're supporting um, the Become an Official program. We're supporting Bench Bad Behavior, all of those things, both in, in through our platforms and resources to help support that. But we're also then asking, hey, help us identify some of your officials that are ready to move on to the next level. And then we want to provide a platform and an easy transition for them to work at the collegiate level. And then finally, in terms of uh, retention and addressing the, the bad behavior, I think Brenda was here earlier. We've partnered with Officially Human. So a part of the remedial, we don't have the, the same types of problems at our contest that I'm hearing from, from you all around fan behavior and um, the, the, the like. It's more about the, the treatment of officials by coaches and student athletes during our competition. So that's been our focus, right? We're uh, at, the comp at the collegiate level, folks misbehave, they, they get dismissed pretty quickly. So that, that hasn't been a, a real issue. And, and we're not having parent meetings at the college level to have you know before the season. So that, that doesn't really work. But what we are doing is the development of um, curriculum that coaches and student athletes as a part of a remediation plan have to complete should they receive yellow cards, red cards, ejected from a contest. So think about compliance tests that you may have to take at your job or work around sexual harassment or behavior, appropriate behavior. If they have these things, they've got to go through this as a part of their remediation to get back into uh, competition. So those are kind of long-winded way, but those are kind of three initiatives that we're really focused in on at the national level. As I indicated earlier, each one of these associations stands separately. The National Officials Committee in the USA National Office work to support them, but they make their decisions within their association. Um, Mike Armstrong is the chair of the National Officials Committee for the past six years, and he has worked with the NCAA and National Federation of High Schools and the National Office working with the marketing department of USA Track and Field so that we're not duplicating the wheel, that everybody's working together on promoting some of these initiatives. Um, Mark Heckel is the training chair, and there are online videos that you can look at that were created by the Junior Officials Program of USA Track and Field. Mike Trago from Indiana, Marcus from Pennsylvania, there are, I believe, 35 modules you can look at. A is an A module and a B module. B is a little more specific to the events. So if you're a new official, you can look at these, and they're five to 10 minutes long, you can read through them. And the World Athletics Organization is revamping their certification process. They have a fantastic free training set of modules. All you have to do is create an account. And again, they're five to 10 minutes long. How do you measure the high jump bar? <laughs> and it shows you what you do to set up and measure the high jump bar. One of the things you need to track and feel, I'm going to the ACC in a couple weeks. We'll have 60 plus officials. We're not talking about three basketball officials at a game. There's 60 for a period of three days. So you have to have volume of people. Um, the personal touch that's been talked about here, every month I get a letter from the officials liaison at the national office telling me, Kern, here are the officials who registered with USA Track and Field this month. I send them a welcome letter. They have my contact information. They can contact me if they have any questions about anything. There are certain links to the rule book and other things that they need to know, letting them know, oh, you just registered an official, you'll be getting a free shirt in the mail. The first shirt is free. Um, this past two years, we've had numerous activities using online, using the Zoom, dare I say that. Um, 
we had a new officials meeting. So all new officials, like maybe three times a year, can log on and just talk and just ask. And there are veteran officials that are on the Zoom who can say, oh, you're in Nevada? Oh, here's who you need to call. Here's who you need to check in with. Oh, you're in Des Moines? Oh, here's who you got. Letting them know here's a connection for you. We've also instituted a round table where there are scenarios that are discussed that people send in. Here are situations that came up at a meeting. Hey, you know what this kid did? He took tape and wrapped it all the way around his shoes on the bottom. Can he do that in the shop room? And so veteran officials are online just to discuss these. You know, it's interactive. But again, we've got to keep things simple. We've got to reach out to people. And we've got to do things that are connecting one-on-one -on -one with people. So as we heard in a previous panel from Lance, there, there really is a belief and a practice of fixing the problem starting at the top with those administrators, with superintendents, athletic directors, or other organizational leads. How can you involve the individuals within your membership in helping to recruit and retain officials? Okay, thanks. I, I would agree that it does start, I think, primarily at the top, and I think this is part of it. Open communication. Communication has got to be the key, and I think we've got to work, you know, to, to keep those lines open and making sure that we understand what each entity is trying to do in order to advance the cause of making sure we're benching bad behavior. No one wants to, athletic administrators, principals, superintendents, even if officials, no one wants to be the bad person. No one wants to go up to the stands, and as Lance talked about in his discipline with dignity, walking up there primarily, standing by him. I've heard examples of you know athletic administrators going up there and basically handing them just primarily a business card, and on the back of the business card, hey, you know, just a reminder, this is an education-based activity. We're thankful for all the participants in this. Those are those are things that you can do, and. Uh, you know, there's other things you can do when you have parents. I know I've heard from athletic administrators to where primarily they would, uh, if one of their students was ejected and they had to sit out or they, had, they were suspended or whatever it may be, uh, they would make them take the National Federation Learn Sportsmanship class. No different for parents. Why wouldn't we hold them accountable? I think it has to be a, a group process of the fact that we're going to continue to communicate the message of what the expectation is. And I think once we communicate the expectation, then at that point we have to carry through. And I think for, for me listening here this day and yesterday, we I, I think we have to be better in making some inroads with the American Association of School Administrators, the National School Board Association, getting in there, because as Lance said, he's absolutely right. Most of our leaders now maybe come from the curriculum field, and I don't mean that negatively. As Brian said, we would not tolerate, you know, a parent going into an English class or primarily a math class and start shouting at the teacher. And so we have to set those expectations. And I think for us and our partnership with the National Federation, we have to be a sounding board to continue to communicate a consistent message and try to make some inroads within other organizations that can help us communicate that message. I was going to share I think that's right on. Leadership requires courage. I mean, I heard folks here saying oftentimes, hey, I know those folks in the community, we have it on our campus, right? I'm not going to move that donor from those seats, right? That's, that's important. But that's the significance. And what I keep sharing with our leadership is it doesn't matter what the size of the jumbotron is. If we don't have the officials, we don't have a game, right? So changing the mindset of what the priorities are around. So that, that includes both holding officials accountable, right? We're asking, we are at the collegiate level, asking more and more of our officials. Folks that are working bowl games or in our final four, you better believe they are thoroughly trained and, and, and Tons of background checks. Can't go here. Can't go that. Like we're we're pretty we're pretty restrictive on on what they can do. Well, the more and more we ask of them, you know, the 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 more the pool shrinks if we're not protecting the group that's coming behind them. So, 
that's my comment is, yeah, leadership requires courage. Earlier in our working group, a uh, gentleman from 360 Group, uh, he mentioned about communication and how a lot of the issue that we're having right now is communication. It's a communication issue. Uh, just in terms of us, uh, it's not growing weary in, you know, trumpeting and being a bullhorn, uh, you know, using your soapbox, quote unquote, uh, to uh, actually get the message out about this uh, crisis that we're experiencing. Uh, you just can't get weary, you can't get tired of speaking it over and over and over, and I think some of us, that could be the case. Uh, we just get tired of having to say the same things over and over, but I would encourage you to just continue uh, to speak that message uh, about the crisis that we're experiencing. But uh, on a specific note, uh, this particular uh, year at our ABCA convention, uh, this past December, we actually brought in Julie Beck and Ann Pufal, and I'm not sure that they had had the occasion to speak to our organization directly, and not just our organization, but to our leadership team. Uh, they actually sat in on our board of directors meeting, and we had a very robust conversation with them. And the key thing is, you know, that officiating gets talked about a lot, uh, but it's not always a dialogue. You know, talk, listen, listen, talk, uh, especially when it comes to uh, administrators or folks like us with the officiating group. Uh, a lot of times, uh, once again, there's a lot of talk about it. And I, I won't, I'll, I guess I'll use the word complain. Uh, there's a lot of complaining about it. Uh, but there's not a lot of dialogue in terms of just listening to one another. Uh, and if we could do more of that, I think ultimately uh, we could definitely try to uh, uh, tackle some of these issues that we're facing. The U.S. 2028 is the number. USA Track and Field 2028. USA will be hosting the Olympics. Conversations. Strategic plans are all looking in that direction. The Chief Operating Officer of USA Track and Field has been very supportive of the National Officials Committee. We give out 10 $500 scholarships each year to USA officials under the age of 40 to defray their costs going to a national meet. They get to pick the meet. Now, it doesn't, people talk about, well, you got it, it's who you know. No, it's not, it's who knows you. Getting younger officials who have the ability and identifying them to get them to work side by side with World Athletics Championship officials so they can see the professionalism of not just in the art of the event. There are also two scholarships given, $500, for implement inspectors. Every meet has to have somebody who takes the shot, the disc, the javelin, the hammer, the weight, and weighs and measures them to make sure they're proper. There are one, two scholarships for technical managers. For national championships, somebody has to go early and make sure the hurdles all measure out every single hurdle. Measuring all the lines on the track to make sure that they are properly measured because you're applying for world championship records. There are now, this year, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, working with the National Officials Committee, through the financial support of the national office, has said, look, we have referees. Everybody doesn't have to be old. We've got younger people who know something, younger people who have savoir faire, younger people who have the communication skills, Let's get them there. So now there are 18 grants given every year for officials to travel, to learn, to improve their craft. In the national office, we've got them to see that it's important to invest in the future. I just want to add on that, and this is this is the official in me. I, I can't emphasize the importance of the mentor-mentee I really, I, and, I, and we're working on that with our athletic administrators because of the turnover, but I'm speaking as an umpire. The confidence that I had as a young umpire walking onto the field with a veteran umpire 
and, and the, the teaching and learning that can take place there. Gene talked about it last night, but I think, you know, that's simple, but to me, that is something we need to continue to reinforce. And I'll, ju I'll just briefly add for us, um, the AAU, we've been at the forefront in a lot of issues, and, and this is something officiating shortage of officials, this is something that we're taking a strong look at, and there comes an opportunity and there comes a time where you have to make a stand. And we understand also that if you, what's going on out there in, in amateur athletic union games, good friend of mine, former NBA official, passed away a year ago, Tony Brown told me something a long time ago. He said, Greg, if you permit it, you promote it. If you permit it, you promote it. So we have to be aware of that and and I told him, I said, well, we are looking at ways to get officials, get them in the game, starting youth officials a little early. And he says, well, you know, the trees we plant today produce the fruit we eat tomorrow, so. So how can the NFHS and your, perspective, your respective organizations best partner to address the state of officiating in the United States? Or in some cases, how are we currently partnering? <clears throat> I'll, I'll be brief with that and I'll go first. Um, as I mentioned before, amateur sports and youth sports, it's a wild, wild west. I mean, you know, people are running events and they're just getting officials the best way that they can. Uh, for most of our events, most of our national championship events, so we call them world championships, we do partner with state high school associations so uh, that are in the area. Most of ours in Florida, North Carolina, Virginia. So that's something new. So you already working with you in a, to a degree. And I'm glad I've had the opportunity to attend this because I talked about the information, the campaigns, the things that you have. We, we're certainly going to take advantage of that. We're currently partners with the National Federation and very excited about that and want to strengthen that partnership. As Mike alluded to, we just returned from Nashville back in December with our largest conference ever, primarily of offering teaching and learning and educating and sharing and collaboration. And, and again, we want that to continue to grow. We feel like that's a message and, and we want to be a model. When I say we want to be a model, the National Federation and the NIAAA of a model for you and your states that as state associations and as state athletic administrators associations, you model. We are stronger when we work together. And I'll just use this analogy. It's very easy for me to go in to my superintendent or my principal and ask and say, hey, I'd really like to go to this conference that's in Orlando or it's in Nashville. And knowing that Julian or Brian or whoever it may be or Michael has met with the superintendents and just kind of touched on the base, hey, there's a professional development conference that's going to be available for athletic administrators. I would encourage you to provide them this professional development opportunity because when they leave there, they're better. And when they're better, that means our students are better, our coaches are better, our programs are better. So it's continued to the, the fact that we need to model that. And we're going to try to do a better job of modeling that as we continue to move forward and try to grow education-based athletics. Just a couple of things quickly. Uh, first of all, at uh, our ABCA convention, it just so happens that uh, alongside uh, the ABCA convention, the Professional Association of volleyball officials actually meets simultaneous to us. Uh, I think that definitely is advantageous to us in terms of relationship building. Uh, the only thing I would challenge us uh, to do as ABCA is to not only uh, leverage that relationship, but to continue to cultivate it. I think there still is sort of that us versus them that still plays a role. Uh, they kind of do their thing and then we kind of do our thing, but I think we need a little bit more crossover in terms of bringing officials and our coaching community together, uh, even if it's in social environments, uh, once again, humanizing officials. Uh, they don't always wear stripes or their uniform. They're, you know, they're not always blowing a whistle, uh, that they do actually have things outside of officiating that they do and having those, once again, that dialogue and those conversations. Secondly, uh, it just so happens this year that Dana was able to come to nice, uh, warm, sunny Omaha, Nebraska uh, this past December, and uh, she was able to share in our ABCA High School Leadership Council meeting, uh, which was good. Uh, I will be calling on her again uh, as, as long as I continue to retweet and like 
all of the social media uh, that they send me maybe once a week. So I think I definitely uh, hit retweet on those and like. Uh, so with that said, I'll continue to be very persistent uh, with having her engage with us along with Lindsay Atkinson, who actually serves on the high, uh, ABCA High School Leadership Council. So that's a couple of things for ABCA. I think I mentioned before our alliance with the, the Federation around supporting the, the officiating recruitment initiatives. I would just want to echo and put a, a bow on, on this that we'd like to take that further with you all, state associations, I think. Um, um, I don't know if Dana said it yet, but our plea, right, about helping to identify um, officials in your respective sports that may be ready for that next level, um, knowing that we are supporting you know, planting those seeds and, and repurposing. One, one of the other things we wanted to share is, and I think uh, I saw my um, former colleague and buddy, Kirk Gibson, give an announcement about Illinois having an alliance with ref reps. We've aligned with ref reps as well and are providing to our member institutions free, like we're paying for the curriculum for X number of students at those institutions to take that. Once they complete that curriculum, take a test, and we're directing them back to your state associations. They're, they're not coming from the classroom or never officiating coming to work our games. They're, they're going to be working in your, in your uh, high school event. So I guess my plea to you is to be open to kind of that alliance and opportunities for reduced or free registration for those types of officials that are coming. I recognize that you know in many of your states, uh, officiating fees is a, is a revenue line item, but my grandpa used to say, you know, you can tell me what's important to you, but you show me what you're spending your money on, that's really important. So I, I would challenge you to think about it differently. If, re if officiating is really that important, then maybe this is a, as a, as a pathway or an opportunity to help grow that pool. Notice how orderly this group is. Notice how <laughs> like down the line. <laughs> Um, you're in Spain, and you're a 16-year-old person officiating. You have the World Athletics Rulebook. And then you're a 28-year-old, you're using the World Athletics Rulebook. You're 78 years old officiating, you use the World Athletics Rulebook. In this country, depending on the meet, you have the World Athletics Rulebook. Then you have the USA Track and Field Rulebook. Then you have the NCAA rulebook, and then you have the National Federation of High School rulebook. Each year there's more and more alignment going on between them. But it's not the rulebook, it's the licensing process for every one of them. So the National Officials Committee has been working through the legal department of USA Track and Field about reciprocity. Also working with the NCAA and the National Federation. For example, I said that I get this email once a month that says these are the new officials. Why can't an email automatically go to their state high school association saying, hey, Jim Schwanson just registered as a USA track official, that their state association knows that maybe they're not a state high school association official but there's legal questions involved in providing that email. How can we get to a rules test that every four years, USA officials, you have to take an apprentice rule test if you're an apprentice. If you're an association, you have to take an association rule test. If you're a national official, you'll take a national official rule test. If you're a master official, you take the master's official rules test. Notice I didn't say anything about NCAA because at the present time there is no NCAA rules test. All the NCAA track officials you see are USA officials. The NCAA is working in the direction of having a rules test and hopefully incorporating it with USA track and field. How can we get all of the rules tests put together so people aren't spending hours and hours and days and days going online to register for this, register for that. And remember, when you're registering for all of these different constituencies, you're also paying for them. What can your organization do, or what is it currently doing, to educate coaches and parents about the need to bench bad behavior at your events? 
Uh, I'll just start off by saying um, definitely with our coaching community, one uh, priority for us uh, not only you know, going forward for sure is to realize that coaches are not only leaders uh, for their team, uh, they're also leaders uh, within their school, their institution, uh, they're leaders within the community. Uh, people look up to them, they're influencers, uh, their uh, student athletes are watching them, uh, the parents are watching them, the fans are watching them, uh, so they're tone setters. Uh, so one thing for ABCA that's definitely going to be a priority, uh, we're going to be very intentional about uh, communication in terms of coaches realizing that um, they set the tone in terms of how they interact with uh, the officials. Uh, if they act a certain way, then more than likely uh, it's going to lead to the fans, the parents, and potentially the athletes acting similar to that. Uh, so we want to make sure that coaches realize they're leaders. Um, they are uh, the ones that, that set the tone. So uh, we want to make sure that we're constantly reinforcing that you need to comport yourself a certain way uh, because at the, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you're, you're the leader and uh, people are going to, uh, to mimic you. Uh, I will add, we're currently, uh, we're sharing resources that we get from the National Federation from the standpoint of benching bad behavior. Uh, Dana just sent us the one on the, the hospitality, and we've sent that out to our membership. I think for me, the takeaway is, is we need to be a little bit more intentional, do a better job of focusing on that in the sense of how we communicate that. And when you talk about benching bad behavior, again, you're talking about how our athletic administrators respond to that game management component. And there's a lot of state associations that direct some things for our athletic administrators for them to be vigilant through that. But, you know, again, I've got a son-in-law who's an athletic administrator. He's an assistant principal AD. He does multiple roles. And I know on any given night he could have three to four events going on at one time. He's got an assistant who coaches. He doesn't have an, he doesn't have an administrative assistant or anything like that. And I know, uh, you know, from a standpoint of what he's dealing with, so I can only imagine what's going on around the country through that. But I think, for me, we need to continue to share re resources. We need to continue to educate in the sense of in keeping open lines of communication. And as we talk about it, let's don't put our blinders on. Let's talk about it. Continue to talk about what the problem is. And the thing about it is, when you think about benching bad behavior, think about what our, we're modeling for our students. These are our future leaders. So if you continue to have incivility, guess what you're going to have in the future? Incivility. This is not so much an issue at track and field meets. It's just a different piece. The only time you're going to see outbursts is coaches at higher levels because this is their life. This is their livelihood. That wasn't a, that was a foul! On the, on the long jump. But they also have a protest that they can file. And it can be looked at because at higher levels, there are videos on everything. And then if they don't like the answer to the protest, they can file an appeal and the jury will rule on it. So they have avenues. But that's the only type of loud outburst you're going to get at a track and field meet is someone just complaining <coughs> of something that just happened. But they have recourse. They have avenues that they can follow to rectify the situation. No, not with that. Uh, well, quickly, uh, uh, the AAU, again, is a complex organization. I mean, it's divided up geographically, uh, nationally, by districts. Every district has a governor. Um, every district also has district sport directors for each of the sports, sometimes it's one and the same uh, individual. But we do have some things in place, not nearly enough um, in terms of governing uh, bad behavior and uh, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Uh, and, and it, uh, let's say, it, it kind of escalates as the competition escalates and that's not the way it should be. You know, it should be just for just a regular game on any given Saturday or weekend. It should be the same as that championship game. 
which uh, there's a little more resources involved with our, our world championships and our national championships. But that's something that we want to be able to address. Every sport has a executive committee that actually runs, uh, you know, governs those national championships. So we all understand that it's something that's needed and that's something that we're going to even work more towards and not just that uh, empty, what we talked about, zero tolerance, but, but we want to be able to have something a little more uh, concrete than that and how to handle those situations. All right, last question for the panelists. What advice would you give to other national organizations in terms of developing a plan to help with the recruitment and retention of officials? We're all in it together. I think I mentioned before, this it's a big tent, right? Um, what uh, Robert was saying about um, registration for this and registration for that, like I hear that all the time from, from officials. So we're trying to eliminate that barrier. We've got to have background checks. We can't have these people out there, you know, around young people without a background check. They've got to have some level of uh, institutional knowledge, right? There's got to be a test, or something. but is there a way that they don't have to do that multiple times, right? So I think that that's really an effort for us and a commitment that we're making at the national level with USA Track and Field, with USA Swimming, with other groups to say, hey, let's, what do you need to know? Maybe we can combine those two things so that these officials don't have to have multiple registrations or pay multiple fees. And again, that's, that's a significant commitment, but for us, it's not a revenue stream, right? And so I, I recognize at other places it may be, but how do, how do we how do we couch that? So that that's that was the I was waiting for this question. That's my plea. It's, it's a big tent, and to, together we can solve these things. To, together, I, re, I really am committed to that. So appreciate the question. Uh, I'll say, Coach Agbo, uh, it it is a challenge, and you everybody has their bucket, yeah. you know, in terms of a revenue. Uh, you take the sport for me for basketball. Who's the national governing body for the sport of basketball? USA Basketball. They have their gold license exam, which I take every year. This has been six years that I've, I've, I've taken it, and, and it's a great program. They wanted to partner with us, the Amateur Athletic Union, to get coaches to take that test, and it requires a background check and all of that, but an AAU membership for non-athlete adults already encompasses a background check uh, when you purchase that, that membership. So um, it's, it's, it's tough, and uh, that's something that we are working with them, USA Basketball. Perhaps we can find some commonalities there, but, but we have some things in place already, and it's just a matter of egos, as you said, Anthony, and people working together and trying to make that happen. I think two things. Number one, first of all, I appreciate the data that's been shared. Mary shared some data. We got some data from, and I, I, I texted Shane. I said, Shane, please tell me I got to quit taking photos of these slides. So you know, I, I've got this information that you're going to send it to me. And thank you, Shane. He said, don't worry about it. Uh, but first of all, I think the data is important. I think we need to get information from our officials. Yeah, and I'm speaking firsthand in the sense as an umpire. I used to know where I wanted to go. And when I got my schedule, I meant I'm not going to tell you. Boy, I like going there because they're going to have a hot dog for me, and they're going to have a you know a Coca Cola, and they're going to have a Snickers bar, or whatever it may be. Or you, officials are human, so they're treated like that. They also know the coaches, where they're going to go, and how they're going to be treated. But I think we need to continue to seek data. And then I think the other thing that we have to do a better job of is promoting those when they're ready. Sometimes, you know, I can remember getting into the profession and I'm like, well, I wonder when I'm going to work a district. You got to pay your dues. Well, if you're good, you're good. And I think that needs to be recognized. And too many times, those that are good don't get recognized and then what happens, we, ends up, we end up losing them. So I think it's two things. We have to continue to be, you know, uh, intentional in the way in which we continue to work on that. Uh, knowledge is key. Uh, Phil mentioned about uh, data, you know, getting the information. Uh, I think sometimes the the transparency it, is it really there? Um, and I'm speaking for myself individually, probably um, is in the sense of understanding the the total spectrum, of understanding the total process. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, assigners, supervisors, 
Um, I'm not sure on the one side that the transparency is there to the point where uh, we can address maybe some of the some of the issues that uh, that are you know happening right now. Uh, and once again, I'm speaking for myself individually. So knowledge, uh, transparency, but then uh, something simple. Just just say thank you. Um, I know from us specifically, uh, we started a uh, what we call officiation week. Uh, it's a play on the word appreciation. Officiation week. Uh, we started that in uh, 2021. Uh, we're looking to take that to the next level uh, here in 2023-24. Uh, um, but just say thank you. Um, I think the, the, the guy, uh, Michael from, from Colorado, low-hanging fruit. fruit. Uh, it's not that hard to you know, just, just say thank you. And don't let it just be the AD, um, you know, the one that's writing the check. Uh, that's, that's not the only thank you. It needs to be the student athletes as well. And uh, that's where we wanted to come in. We want to have the coaches. Uh, make it a part of the culture of their team. Uh, I know a lot of them do. They, they make them walk up to the official and say thank you, but we want that to be universal. Uh, saying thank you to someone who is a part of the game. Uh, it's not us versus them. Uh, if we want to have a good sport experience, then we need officials. They're not a necessary evil. They're necessary. The hospitality aspect very important. How you treat officials. Where do track officials get things? <coughs> Division three track meets. If almost every kid at every event will come up and say, thank you for being here today. You're working at the long jump and not, you're walking out and somebody who just ran the 5,000 will come and say, thank you for being here today. But if you're going to recruit, what is your target audience? What's the target audience that filters into your organization? You know, is it parents? Is it coaches? Maybe you need to talk to your officials and say, hey, how did you get here? What was your path? I never ran track in my life. I was a good glove, no hit shortstop who played basketball and played basketball for three years at Division Three UW Oshkosh but we started a track club in Milwaukee with three kids. And within five years, we had 80. And I was a clerk, because nobody else was crazy enough to do it for the conference meets. One person for 15 schools. Well, then it was time for me to move on. My daughter graduated from high school. I became a starter, and now for 20 years, I've been on this platform. Find out how your officials got to become officials. Then you'll know what your target audience is, and there's where you're going to get your bang for your buck. I apologize if you get this, but every morning I get a, a quote from Simon Singh, and when I read it this morning, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. It says, our vision is only actionable if we share it. Without sharing it, it's just a figment of our imagination. That's why meetings like this are so important. Thank you, Phil. I believe that uh, takes us right to 4.15, which is the end of our time. But gentlemen, thank you so much for your participation and for your advice and your wisdom and everything that you've shared with us. Uh, we appreciate you and certainly individuals if you want to ask these gentlemen questions just feel free to approach them afterward we're going to take just a second to transition them off of the stage and bring davis up so don't leave thank you gentlemen.